The topic that I've been asked to speak on is the future of higher education and trying to keep up and, and how do we keep up. So what I thought I would do is share some insights that you can then take back and think about past this conference and certainly reach out by social media or LinkedIn and email and let me know if you have any questions on some of the concepts that we're going to cover today. So 13 years ago, Amazon was created. That little online bookstore now is the third largest company in the world based on revenue. It has changed the way in which we live. Um, 10 years ago, the iPhone and the Android phone were introduced to us. It now is interfused technology into everything that we do. So when we think about where we are in today's world, it is one of the most exciting times with this intersection of technology and globalization coming together for dramatic change that will now allow us to not just keep up, but really create new paradigms, create new processes, new ways of doing things that have never been done before and that there are no rules or really requirements. So in the same way that Amazon, the iPhone, the Android phones have entered our lives and changed the way in which we live, we can apply those concepts, not only to higher education, but to business, nonprofit, to any industry really, because it's not about trying to keep up. That's so hard to do, being one step ahead of your neighbor or trying to see what he or she's doing and trying to keep up. It really is about leading. And so from that context, I will be introducing the paradigm um, of, and the factors that will help you to lead your organization effectively and efficiently. But it is not just for higher ed. And I know that we have people from all industries. Keeping up for leading, let's go with leading. So the four factors that I've identified of creating your own path for success uh, have been triangulated, of course, through research, through my own experience, and from also CSU Global and what I'm going to share with you past this slide. But the first item that I'd like you all to consider is the embrace of diversity beyond what has been done before. That, in fact, in higher ed, we think about diversity demographically in business, and even in higher ed now, in any industry, because of this dramatic change that we are now encountering due to technology, due to globalization, is that really the ability to think beyond your industry, beyond what has been done before, will allow your ability to actually move your organization, move your institution to the next level to not only survive, but really to thrive. The second item is to treat money as a sacred resource. Money allows for investment, investment that is needed for change, investment that is needed to make your organization more efficient through technology, through outsource uh, services. It is not about just covering your overhead the more that you are able to be organizationally efficient, which is my third point, will allow you to, in fact, save extra funds to find areas of, of funds, financial resources, so that, in fact, you can make the necessary investments in technology, in testing new pathways towards your success, to really identifying who your customer is and how you best serve them, or who your student, student is and how you best serve them. And then the final and fourth factor, so it's not very many, but the fourth one is to take calculated risks, run small scale experiments. And I know that that could be a new concept for you, but in a world in which the uh, paradigms, traditional ways of doing things have really changed because technology and globalization have had such a great impact that in order to figure out who you're really serving and with what tools or what processes and methodologies really requires that you test 
what you think will work, or maybe what you've done through research and triangulated that information, and come back with, this is a process that we think will be really successful in engaging our students or our clients. And then it's about testing that in a very small scale way so that it is not using up a bunch of resources and you're not throwing what money you were able to save um, through your organizational efficiency. It is about then being very strategic in watching the outcomes. Are you, through your small scale experiment, actually getting to the outcome that you had hoped or that you had targeted? And if so, you can then take it to the next level. At CSU Global, we talk about uh, tossing a pebble, throwing a rock, and launching a boulder. And that is, in fact, a really efficient, effective way to start small with a little research experiment project and, and to actually grow so that when you go to scale and put a significant resources behind it, that you're actually able to then get a return on investment from your funds and from the hard work that you have done. So if we put this all together, into what CSU Global has done, and I will move us to this next slide. As an example, uh, we can look at CSU Global and where we started with 200 students in 2008 to, as Dr. Bellum mentioned, almost 20,000 today. We have been able to look at and define our own market. So when Global first came up, we looked at, or CSU Global first was originated, we really looked at the market, we looked at our mission, and we knew that at that time, only 25% or so of the students were non-traditional, but we were able to identify that was the niche that we would be serving, and then make some very small strategic investments and experiments to understand what would engage them and what did they respond to and and to I actually start to set those goals of what should retention look like what does success look like and once we were able to figure that out we were then able to scale and so being able to create our own paradigm and our own framework for what was success really allowed us not to just follow all the traditional institutions or even the for-profit online institutions as a follower and trying to um, succeed and keep up. It was really about what should we be doing to serve these unique non-traditional students in a way that actually embrace, engage them, embrace them, and help them to be successful towards their own personal goals, whether it was for their family or for their professional environment. That allowed us to then set our roles, set our goals, and come out in front and lead in a way where now the market has actually flipped and there are now 75% of all students in higher education are non-traditional. And so when we go back and think about Amazon, iPhones, Android phones, Southwest Airlines, all companies and products and services that in their time, they define, those companies defined what their market would look like and what they would do to serve that market in a way that had never been done before, which allowed them to lead, even if they were very small at the time, to lead and to continue to grow. And so CSU Global being an example of that in higher education, we hope will help empower and excite you to think about your own organization, your own institution, and how you, in fact, can identify your niche of who you are trying to serve. Have you considered very carefully what services and ways in which you're continuing to engage and provide them benefit because that's they're coming to you for a reason and your ability to serve them and to meet their unique needs is really where we're going as a world. It's so interesting as we use technology for scale and for mass service provision, 
really what we're seeing is this individual need to be recognized as an individual, to have the social, even if online, interactions where people are treated as individuals and that they are able to connect to others and, and have this human touch approach, even if it's through technology mediated interaction. And so there's so much opportunity for you and your organization or your institution to identify who it is you want to serve, with what tools, what processes, what is it that they need, and why are they coming to you? And if you can provide that service and experience that they're seeking, you are able to create your own paradigm so that you lead and not just try to follow, because that's very hard to do. So as we move forward today, I hope that some of these concepts will resonate and give you something to reflect on. And as you move past even this conference, I hope that that's been helpful. And I will now open uh, us up for a question and, and I will do my best to respond to them and within a context that I hope will be helpful. Thank you, Becky, appreciate those remarks. Um, like she mentioned, we are happy to open it up to any questions we have now. I have a couple, but I just want to remind everybody there's a Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to enter your question there and uh, we'll get through as many of them as we can um, in the few minutes we have before our next session. So, Becky, the first question we have comes from Melanie and she asks, how important is it to have specific desired outcomes defined before taking risks? Yeah, absolutely. As in the organization, with any type of initiative, there needs to be a defined goal so that you're not wasting money, time, and other resources. You can set the goal, the bar, and that may be too high, but set it. Get buy-in from your organization and the people, the stakeholders that are, are doing the hard work. Set that and then start to run your experiment. And I have to say, in every organization I've run, and CSU Global is no different, that it takes three to four times of fine tuning, the little experiments or the small scale of research project you're running to really get to where you feel that the processes of your experiment are sound. And you look at that data and decide, well, you know, is this where we need to be? Or is there other outcome or are there other outcomes that in fact are really relevant and really valuable and do we need to take another look? So as you set your, your target and move your experiment forward, this I, concept of continual improvement and measurement is absolutely vital uh, to knowing that you are succeeding and that you're actually able to get to your goal. And you will find, you know, we, I think people think that things we do here at our, our university have just come up overnight. And I can tell you there have been years of experiments, you know, as we look at cohorts of students and different things that we do, that we are always looking at that data and making a tweak or two or three or completely starting from scratch and starting again, but we try to just make incremental changes over the next two to three, and if we have to, fourth experiment before we get to the results that we need. So don't give up. Our next question comes from Linda. As many are non-traditional students and some working on the second half of their careers in new areas, has CSU Global considered incorporating and promoting more internships for students to break into these areas? Absolutely. You know, with our mission of workplace success and our work to provide a return on investments for our students, we have, uh, we currently do provide internships or practicums in some of our degree programs, but in the recreation, uh, using our data, we are now working to create CSU Global 2.0, which will launch for our fiscal year 2020, and that incorporates everything that we know about our students. And so as we move forward, um, you will see that in the 2020 year, the redesign of all of our academic programs even, with the learning experiences even more closely tied to workplace. So that will include, in fact, more internships and apprenticeships in that learning experience, as well as simulations, 
really a more interactive approach so that when our students, in fact, if they change careers, we know about 23% of our students actually do, that they will be able to hit that ground running when in their job and be successful. Unfortunately, because of the pace of technology that has made our world just so much faster, employers don't um, really have the time or I would hate to say patience, but in fact patience for training and for this longitudinal, you know, I'm going to come in and in a year I can actually show you what I can do. It is now really a plug and play world where we know that our students must, after they graduate or complete a certificate or even a single course, be able to go out and show to their employers what they are learning or what they have learned and how they are able to add value to their organization and to their profession. And on that same subject line, our next question comes in, does CSU Global consider work experience for credit? CSU Global does. Um, we will, the practicums, the internships, we actually have faculty work uh, on the learning outcomes the demonstration of learning, what is required in order for us to provide degree credit uh, for those experiences. So it is much more prescriptive than just volunteering at your local animal shelter or um, homeless shelter. It's very clear on what the learning outcomes need to be and what the demonstration of learning needs to be, but all very doable and achievable for our non-traditional learners. Uh, you mentioned looking, this one comes in from Jason, excuse me, and you mentioned looking at students as target markets. Do you think that not that many non-traditional universities are missing the boat in that regard? Gosh, you know, the paradigm of, or the, the population, student population has shifted so dramatically from 25% to now 75% that if in fact an institution is not serving those students, it needs to be very clear on who it's serving because now you're looking at a smaller population and with what services. So I see many institutions now trying to work towards serving non-traditional students. Uh, non-traditional students are very different from traditional students. So their understanding of who those students are and what they need in order to be engaged and to be properly served so that their needs are met so that they in fact retain and are able to successfully meet their goals is really important. So while I would say yes, institutions need to be looking at non-traditional students, I also say that if you don't understand them, that's a very expensive endeavor to make an investment to serve such a different student body, wherein if you're really good at serving traditional students that are living on campus, going to school full time, that what is that niche of those students and could you not be harvesting um, returns from your investments that you make there over trying to go into a whole new area of service? So while I encourage people to really look and leaders to look at non-traditional students or different types of clients if they're in business, um, that it really has to be very intentional. So to start with these small experiments where you're using not a whole lot of money and try some small cohorts, 5, 10, 20, and see what, see if it's working, see if they're engaging, see if their survey results come back positive on the work that you're doing, and don't give up. So if you start uh, an experiment and you spend so much money because it's a huge group, you won't have the money left to run the second, third, and maybe fourth experiment to really get you to where what you're doing and the service and the processes that you're providing really resonate with the person, individuals, type of student, type of client that you're actually trying to attract and retain. Next question comes from Harvey. Would you consider millennials to be the largest target market now? Yeah. So millennials, Generation Z, uh, Generation Z is slightly larger than the baby boomers, if from my understanding on the research. So that is a really different type of an audience. We are seeing at CSU Global uh, a, a shift in our population to millennials. But I must say, we are really preparing as well for Generation Z, knowing how large that is and how very different they are. They are, in fact, the babies 
who grew up playing with their mom or dad's iPhone or iPad, um, interacting with technology at a very early age, um, who really see the world very differently, that they can in fact communicate with somebody in another country without any problem. And they have friends who they don't see face to face necessarily, but who they see from around the world through um, technology mediated devices. Um, so there's this need to be connected with humans, but in a very different way than we've ever seen. Plus, because of the instantaneous way that they can interact with technology, play games and how fast technology moves, that their brains are actually, uh, according to research, different. And so as we even see in some of the behaviors of millennials, that in keeping them engaged is a challenge. They, in fact, if we're talking about higher ed, will increasingly be pulling experiences from all over, not necessarily just staying on the track in college, even if they went in as a freshman, right after high school, staying on that track to complete is going to be very, very difficult because that is not the way they've experienced the world. The way they experience the world, even in their games, is they get to pull these little pieces from all these different worlds and put them together. That's how they will expect to experience their formal education to, towards getting a degree, a certificate, and really how they see the role of higher ed. It is a piece, but so is an apprenticeship. So is working at a company or going overseas and, and trying to get a job, you know, somewhere in another country. It is just a more worldly, more global view, and that is beyond just geographical borders. It is just the way they see the world. It is much bigger in their minds and in their experience than Gen X, baby boomers for sure, and even for some millennials. And we've talked a lot about retention here. So we have a comment here from um, a, a student, I believe. So uh, he developed test anxiety during my senior year of high school, which prevented me from succeeding in college. And I wasn't able to get assistance from college counselors and eventually dropped out because of this. The CSU Global and other online institutions have resources to help with these various learning challenges. Absolutely. Uh, we see that a lot. And really, is a test the best way to verify knowledge. And when we think about CSU Global's mission, very different from other institutions that I know are participating in this conference, but in fact, it's very different because we want them to be plug and play in the workplace. And so having a standardized test, even if it's proctored, is not really me ensuring that our students are well equipped to be successful, to actually execute on our mission. So at CSU Global, we offer uh, programs and, and opportunities for demonstration of knowledge in many different ways. They could in fact be presenting on PowerPoint and on video that could be recorded, uh, a presentation for our business. And if we're talking about maybe our data analytics course, um, the outcomes of some sort of study in a way that they would be able to actually use that in their workplace or use it in, as an example of their ability to function as a data analytics or a data analyst in their workplace so that in fact it helps them get a job or move up in their current career. So uh, having high stakes tests is not the most effective nor is it really an appropriate way to necessarily an appropriate way to verify knowledge in non-traditional learners and students and certainly for those that are in the workplace and if the mission is workplace success. I've not ever come into the workplace where I had to take a test on my knowledge in marketing or finance. I've actually had to demonstrate it by looking at a PL and providing my analysis, right? Because that's real life. And that is a better, more effective way to equip, I think, students of today. Plus, we're talking about this whole world, the way in which they see the world. And if you can't engage them with ways in which they can decide it's meaningful, they're not going to stay. And we, we see that. And so when we talk about CSU Global 2.0 and what we're doing with all of our programs, it is a way in which we not only help make sure that they are successful in the workplace as to our mission, but that they find that it is value to them to really be learning um, and not just floating through courses or dropping out because they don't see a real value. 
And actually speaking of value, you just led me right into our next question. So this is from an anonymous um, participant, but they've asked, how are employers responding to online graduates? Yeah. I can tell you eight years ago, nine years ago with CSU Global when we first started, um, it was difficult. And today we have constant demand from employers that are seeking uh, online curriculum help. They actually want to be taking their org training and putting it and put it online because they understand that we can capture the data from their employees that are taking the courses, that they can see what the level of engagement looks like, and that they can actually help have their employee be able to learn when their employee is able to learn. So rather than pay the expense of sitting in one big classroom or seminar room and working on email or texting or doing whatever that the employer one on or that that employee one on one can go into an online mediated learning experience and go through the content uh, do some interactive exercises demonstrate their knowledge through um, little quizzes or interactive games that it's so much more beneficial and cost effective and that they can measure their outcomes and return on their investment that employers now are seemingly because of their demand and putting their on organizational training online have not had an issue with online educated students again the way that employers are now expecting people to arrive at their jobs as plug and play the proof is in can they do the work or can they not and if they can't they don't get to keep that job and they certainly don't move up and so even at CSU Global, we, we measure it, the percentage of students that are employed, but we also measure, are they increasing in salary? Are they getting promotions? Um, how successful are they post their certificate or degree? Because that is a real measure of success. It is not just handing out diplomas. That doesn't really matter as much to employers as can the people do the work. And, and I think that we see this trending of stackable certificates. And it's because employers need what they need and they need it now, because if they wait another 18 months, the market shifts and needs shift and what they need their employees to do, in fact, may also and is shifting. And so the ability for employees to keep learning is also putting added pressure on employers who are seeking partnerships with formal institutions like a CSU Global or who are creating their own online training so that these employees can continue to be upskilled because every 18 months now the world is really shifting in a way that we can't predict accurately because we haven't lived through that yet. Great. We have time for just a couple more, so we will get through just a couple more questions. So thank you everyone for your participation so far. Um, Paul asked, do you encourage faculty to try out those small and media, medium experiments as the courses progress, especially the faculty who teach the same courses every term? You know, faculty have the ability to post an announcement, to do a recap, to host live sessions with their students taped sessions with their students. So depending on the content of whatever they're teaching, the thought always has to be just like you would if you were in a face-to-face -face classroom. When you see that the students aren't paying attention, that you've got to shift course and figure out what, what is interesting to them and how, how would they better engage. That is absolutely important that in fact, we all are continuing to do that. And we see that even in student advising. You know, they're now offering special um, appointments where students can schedule a really late time if that works best for them. Again, as we look at millennials, Gen Z coming up, that individualized attention and customization of what they are seeking is what's important to them. And if we don't meet that, they disengage and go somewhere else that, can't, that will address their needs. Great. So I've saved this one for last and we only have two minutes left, so I've put you on the spot here, but Robert asked, what gets you most excited about online learning's future? Will it, what will all be different in five to 10 years from now? I think I'm so excited about online's uh, technology-based uh, education that will provide true scaffolding, true adaptive learning experience so that we don't leave students behind. When we think about the demographics of our nation and how it shifts from 
more first generation and global right now serves 41 percent of its students are first generation and 28 percent are from underserved populations but in fact as we look forward into the future the underserved populations grow in percentage first generation grow and if we leave them behind higher education is not doing its job and so to be able to use technology to provide that customized adaptive learning experience where a student can come in and do a, a, an assessment a pretest, figure out where they need where they're weak and then work on those areas or start off in a class have some trouble and be able to stay within the class not go back to remedial work but stay within the class and pick up through um, a link the extra learning they need to stay with their class allows them, again, to have this customized experience. But when we think about higher education as an industry, allows us to move these other populations forward where maybe we haven't been able to do that because it's expensive, it's, it is very difficult to do to be able to provide a customized it's like a one-on-one -on -one learning experience instructor to a student that technology can help do that mediation so that, in fact, anybody who comes to higher ed could, that if they have the tenacity, be able to engage and learn and catch up and move their lives forward. So I am so excited about that possibility within the next five years. I mean, CSU Global has already been working on it. Um, we know we have a, a ways to go and 2.0 will help, but as technology continues to get less expensive in these areas and uh, more user friendly, we expect that in fact our adapt will be able to also adapt to keep up and provide that experience so that we can see our data on first gen and non traditional students catch up um, increasingly so as we've been working with all our other student populations.